This conference will now be recorded. Hi guys, it's Jordan here. Um, so listen, I'm recording this uh, webinar. We tried doing a live webinar today and there were some significant technical difficulties. Um, I'm not sure what was happening. So anyway, we're, we're creating this recording so that this resource can be made available to anybody that, that wants to watch it. So I apologize to those that were on the live recording um, and things didn't work out. So I know that can be very, very frustrating. So let me just, I'm gonna start over again here. So just to give you a brief overview about myself and about um, our mastermind group and, and how these recordings work. Um, so my name is Jordan Tong. I'm one of the owners at France Building Services. We're a janitorial contractor based out of Western Kentucky. Um, we have about 600 employees. We operate in three states and have uh, five or six branch offices. Um, and in addition to that, I uh, run a janitorial coaching group or a mastermind group. That's a web-based group for leaders and owners in the janitorial industry. Um, and we have about 100 members in our group. And uh, we're basically a place where we learn together, we grow together, we connect with our peers. Um, and we're constantly trying to provide valuable information to help us be better leaders and to navigate um, the process of growing and scaling our companies. Um, but today we're, we're trying to navigate a current crisis that's affecting us. Um, so on the call today, I have Brian Lewis. He's our company president and he oversees all the day-to-day -day, um, operational things within the organization and basically runs the organization from a day-to-day -day, uh, perspective. So this issue of the coronavirus is obviously a big deal. And we felt the need to do this webinar because there's been a lot of information out there. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of information, but um, a lot of the information has not necessarily been relevant or helpful to how do we navigate this thing as a leader in our industry. So what are the specific issues that we are facing as owners and leaders in the commercial cleaning industry? And then how do we navigate those issues? And so that's really what we're trying to address today. Um, so in terms of the mastermind group, so normally we do these webinars and they're just for the uh, members of our mastermind group. So um, those hundred or so business owners that are in our industry that are part of our group. Um, but we feel like this one was one that we needed to make available to everybody because this is an issue that everybody is facing um, and needs help with. Um, however, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about our group, you can go to this web site here at the bottom, elitebusinesscoaching.net. And if you click on a, a link at the top that says mastermind groups, you can go in and look and learn a little bit more about the groups. Uh, our plan today is after uh, we get this video recorded that we're going to um, post something on our, our base camp, which is our hub for our mastermind group. We're gonna have a, a whole section on there of files and documents and, and links that will help um, give you more information and more content. So things like letters that you might send out to customers, pricing strategies, um, more information about chemicals and equipment and things that, that you can utilize during this process. And then we'll have specific threads on our forum on there where people can discuss some of these issues. So again, if you'd like to join the group or learn more about that, we're gonna put a lot of additional content on there to help you guys navigate some of this. So I'm happy to answer any questions about that. So before diving in, I, I think it would be helpful for us to just to do a quick overview about what's going on. Again, you guys have been watching and listening to enough stuff that you really don't need me to, to, to give you any more information about it. But I want to, to set the stage here a little bit for us and, and learn a couple of things about how this relates to us and our industry and how it would affect our companies. So the first thing that I think is important for us to know is that... Um, you know, as we've been trying to figure out where's this thing going to go, there's a lot of uncertainty ahead of us. Um, one of the the trend lines that I've been watching and that a lot of other people have been watching is how we're tracking with other other countries that contracted the illness before us. So where cases started showing up in other places and, and started growing in those areas, how is our country comparing to those? And Italy is probably the best test case. Uh, so this data here is as of yesterday. Um, I put this together at midnight last night to give you the most up-to-date information. So we were trending with Italy for the first 15 or so days, and then we started actually outpacing them. Um, and so just from a mathematical standpoint, the way this thing grows exponentially, um, 
before we start seeing cases flatten off, um, we're looking at you know probably four, three, four, five, six weeks of some pretty significant growth. Um, you know, the good news is that the death rate is 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 fairly low, um, and it's it's high for those that are in a certain risk category. But in terms of total population, it's still pretty low, probably in the you know less than two percent, maybe even less than one percent, if we knew the total amount of of cases that are actually there. Um, but the way this plays out for us is that there's going to be a significant um, economic downturn that we're obviously already experiencing for for a variety of factors. Um, so the risks I think that face us, number one, is just the rapid spread of the illness and and how that may affect our team members um, or our customers. <laughs> Um, I think number two is the effects on the economy. So when you've got this rapid increase, you have this high level of uncertainty. Um, you have quarantining, which then leads to slow economic activity, which then leads to customer shutdowns, which then leads to cleaning not being needed, which then leads to reduced revenue and potential layoffs for us. So you can see this, this chain of events kind of, it sets off these reactions that end up potentially hurting our organization so we need to figure out how can we navigate some of this stuff and limit some of the risks limit some of the downsides to this and maybe even find some of the upsides in ways that we can really shine and maybe even grow or improve our business during this time so with that said i want us to just walk through some of the practical strategies that we can can use to navigate this crisis um, and so as we've been thinking and talking and listening to other webinars and, and really investigating this, this issue, and as we've had some internal uh, meetings, it, it looks like there's, there's basically six key issues. And I think any other issue can probably be summarized under one of these headings. Uh, and number one is, is how do we engage our customers and, and how do we go about being proactive with them? Uh, number two is understanding the difference between sanitizing or cleaning and actual disinfecting. So there's a big difference between those two um, as it relates to our contracts and our day-to-day -day work. Um, and that's something I think we need to explore. Number three is how do we navigate customer slowdowns or shutdowns? Um, what should we do or not do? Um, how do we handle uh, extra work requests and the urgency that comes with some of those? What do we do if there's a confirmed case either at one of our employees has or that one of our customer locations? And then what sort of liabilities do we face um, in terms of dealing with customers or with our own staff? So we want to just dive in and explore each of these six issues and how they relate and try to offer some practical ways to help you navigate this and maybe move forward um, and hopefully turn what's a crisis into an opportunity for us to really shine as an organization uh, during this time. So Brian, I'm going to maybe turn this over to you in, in terms of engaging customers. So obviously this is on everybody's radar so so maybe walk us through like what should it look like is you know if we have 10 customers or 50 or 100 customers how do we go about thinking about this or interacting with the customers you know do we do we wait for them to call us do we call them yeah, like, like, what does this look like for us no i think not i think uh our customers in this industry are, are really starving uh to have a, a peace of mind and to know for sure that uh, you know their their contractor has this kind of under control so this is a very unique opportunity for us to really step up and shine and, and not only have an impact on our customers to the positive, but, but even have an impact on our community uh, with preventing sickness and even death, um, as extreme as that may be. Um, this also kind of ultimately saves customers a lot of money and, and lost production time and revenue and all that stuff. So the very first thing I think I would encourage people to do is basically get together with your leadership team and walk through all the different pieces of this and all the potential exposures, potential scenarios to make sure that everybody is kind of on the same page with what you do and do not want to do. Um, and that way, as people are out engaging customers, you know, the direction that people take, it actually reflects kind of what you've decided as a group that you once again want to do or do not do. Uh, I think it is important to have this game plan in place. To be honest, we may, we probably did not have a solid enough game plan in place to deal with this kind of before it happened. This is obviously new territory for us. Um, I think it is something though, uh, as this precedent is set, 
I think it's something that's maybe more likely to happen in the future when future seasonal illnesses come about. Um, I think people are going to be more likely to shut down or maybe panic a little bit more than they have in the past with some of the other seasonal uh, viruses like bird flu or a million of the others that have come about. So I think it's very important to to put a game plan together, obviously for this time and in the future. So um, I think some of the ideas on what we can do, uh, especially considering that peace of mind to the customer, I think it's it's important to get out in front of this. Uh, so one of the very first things that we did after we sat down as a as a as a team and decided how we wanted to move forward, we basically sent a kind of a proactive letter to our customer and let them know, hey, here's the here's the situation, here's obviously what we do and and how we can help you and your team and your business. Um, and you could obviously angle that letter a million different ways. You could have it emphasize additional services. You could have it emphasize just some, you know, uh, some genuine caring on your part. Uh, you could approach it a number of different ways. But so I would, I would start by sending a letter to the customer, letting them know kind of what's happening. I would also maybe outline really kind of a written plan to the to the team um, as well, just to kind of recap what you've decided as a leadership group just so everybody who's engaging those customers in the field, once again, to make sure that they're approaching all their decisions um, in, in the same manner. Um, obviously, you could also, with engaging customers, you could you know, create an additional piece for uh, kind of a promotional piece for additional services on the different options uh, of how you could help customers and pricing and all that stuff as well. So there are a number of different ways I think we can engage our customers. Yeah, and so Brian, so instead of having waiting for someone to call and say we're going to be closing down, mm -hmm. or we're freaking out or whatever, to yeah. go to them first to have to give them some options to get, to help them think through it. Yeah, without a uh, doubt. And I think the important part of that is I don't think any of us have to be professionals on this. Obviously, we're not we're not biochemists. We don't I don't think we need to spout off how many people are dying, how many people are getting sick and really get into the biochemistry of this because we're not pros on that, but what we are pros on is how to do what we do. And the good news is you know, this virus is is not handled any differently than any other virus in regard to disinfection method or anything else. So once again, while we're not pros on all the the the, the down and dirty on this we know what the heck we're doing because we've been doing it out there for, for a long time. So I think by giving people just a, a real clear matter of fact game plan and strategy on how we can help them uh, to kind of eliminate the panic, I think that that goes a long way. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. So, so Brian, you, you've mentioned that this isn't any different than, um, than another virus in terms of how we would, would go about mm -hmm. cleaning for it. So, you really you brought this to my attention the other day about the difference between sanitizing and disinfecting. So yeah. maybe talk to me a little bit about how those two things are different, and yeah. and then how that relates to our contracts and the way that we normally clean. Because uh, you yeah. you sh you show me that there's a difference in in those two things. Yeah. Um, I may be kind of giving info to you know to a lot of people who already know all this stuff, but just in case, just to kind of just uh, summarize the difference between a few of these things. Um, cleaning, you know, it, and, and, and let me back up by saying all these terms are always thrown out by everybody, especially our customers, and they're thrown out interchangeably and they're thrown out in wrong context and all that stuff. So once again, this is a, a good opportunity for us to step up and really kind of educate people and, and consult people and, and show our value uh, to our customers. But you know, I mean, essentially cleaning, which is what we do in the, probably the majority uh, majority of our buildings, it's really just wiping away dirt and dust and, um, you know, microorganisms and bacteria and all that stuff. So we're really just wiping away those things. We're not, we're not killing anything. We're mostly just wiping away all those things from our, our uh, customer locations. I mean, the good news is, even cleaning alone helps prevent sickness because it does wipe away a lot of the germs that, that would be there otherwise. 
So even if we're only going to the clean level, at, you know, at a lot of our customer locations, it's it's definitely helping. Not only is it making things look better, but it's helping contribute toward reducing germs and sickness. So uh, cleaning is not a bad thing. It's 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 obviously a very good thing. <laughs> Uh, sanitizing kind of falls right between cleaning and disinfection. So as we sanitize, ultimately what we're doing is really kind of lowering germ counts. We're not killing anything. We're, we're not just wiping things away. We're really kind of lowering germ counts. So that, you know, sanitizing typically uh, requires heat uh, and, and lots of other things. So sanitizing kind of falls right between cleaning and, and disinfection. So disinfection, which is what uh, kind of is being brought to the table now more than maybe ever, it goes a step further than both in that disinfecting actually kills viruses and bacteria. As long as you're using the appropriate level of disinfectant to kill whatever you're trying to kill. So historically, to kind of give you some, some meat to this, historically, most of our programs, they uh, revolve around cleaning and or sanitizing the majority of, of our customer buildings, but then we disinfect restrooms. So we use an actual disinfectant and restroom to help, you know, kill germs. Um, the trick is with this coronavirus and some other SARS type viruses is that the not all disinfectants are strong enough to actually kill this virus. Okay, so as we are uh, talking about killing this virus specifically, we got to make sure that we're using a chemical that's strong enough and qualified and certified to kill this virus. And, you know, the CDC and a number of other organizations have released a list of chemicals. I'll make sure that we post that to the to the mastermind site. But so so as we disinfect, as we look at that process, the biggest, most important part of the of the disinfection process is dwell time. If we're doing good old manual, old fashioned disinfecting, we have to spray that chemical on any surface and let it dwell for up to 10 minutes, okay? Uh, our main disinfectant chemical that we use here uh, to kill this virus or other kind of sickness type viruses, we use something called HALT uh, and it's uh, put out from Spartan Chemical. The dwell time on that chemical, along with a lot of others, is pushing 10 minutes for full disinfection. So that's the biggest key in doing old kind of manual, kind of old manual disinfecting. So disinfecting is killing germs, killing organisms, all that stuff. And once again, leaving a surface wet for the dwell time is key to disinfection. Yeah. So where this would be helpful is number one, being able to yeah. give your customers a sense of um, in terms of the things you need to know, not everything about the mm -hmm. virus, but how to, to to disinfect for it would be one. And then also, I'm sure some people have encountered customers that think that disinfecting should just be part of the cleaning process right. or that, hey, instead of just doing what you normally do, just use disinfectant now. Well, yeah. it's, it's different than probably what you're contractually signed up to do. So most likely it's going to involve some sort of price increase to be able to you to do the kind of thing, the disinfecting versus just regular cleaning. Yeah, without a doubt. And, and most mostly that comes from just sheer dwell time, you know, and I'm not talking, as I mentioned this, I'm not talking, you know, fogger or electrostatic sprayer or any of that stuff. We're talking about kind of good old fashioned uh, disinfecting right now. So because of the dwell time that's needed to fully disinfect, it does create a longer time, a longer labor, uh, now, are we Sorry. using the fog Sorry. or the electrostatic spray or anything? Yeah, any so we are in some cases. I mean, I think it has a you know a completely separate group of pricing, and I think we'll probably get into that here shortly as we're okay. talking about additional services. But yes, okay, yeah, a lot of people are doing that right now. So, so Brian, let's talk about about shutdown. So, I had a phone conversation with one of our our mastermind group members yesterday, and he runs their Colorado operation for a they're a really large company. I think they're about seventy million, and. Uh, they um, have been have been working on creating a list of customers that are likely to shut down and those that are likely not going to shut down and trying to, to navigate what, what's their operation going to look like if they have significant shutdown. So the first thing that I would suggest um, that you do is really take stock of your customers and have some conversations to figure out, okay, where do we think we're going to lose some 
some business for a short period of time. Um, and then where do we think we're going to keep business? So some of your more essential places like medical facilities, um, any labs, pharmacy related stuff. So there's probably going to be a lot of customers that, that are probably not going to shut down. Yeah. Um, but then you're probably going to have some other ones that will. And so part of that will be paid. So if you're, if you're a manufacturing plant that is related to the auto industry, because yeah. of the closures of GM and Ford, you're likely going to have some shutdowns there. Um, so that'd be something just to keep in mind to think about it as you're planning for this. But Brian, if we've got some customers that are thinking, okay, we're going to be shut down for two weeks or three weeks, how do you go into that conversation instead of just rolling over yeah. on your back and saying, mm -hmm. okay, like what, what do you do to, <laughs> yeah. to maybe try to help, you know, still serve that customer, but not lose revenue? Like what does that conversation yeah. look like? Yeah. Um, in such a way that, <clears throat> you know, you don't want to go in and say, well, I can't afford to, you know, right. not be here for two weeks. How can we serve them well, but still maintain at least a good portion of our revenue? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, this definitely needs to, as you guys get your leadership teams together and decide how you want to handle all these scenarios, this this definitely needs to be a part of that conversation. Um, so I think as we're as we're addressing customers, because you guys have seen it just like we have, man, we've got some customers out there who are panicking and they're, um, taking this to an extreme that it may not need to go to. So I think it's important for us to, to be slightly knowledgeable. We don't have to be pros, but we have to kind of calm the customers down and really kind of obviously let them know what we can do for them here. But I think the first conversation we need to have with them is the importance of keeping our hourly team members in that scope of work rolling while they're shut down. Okay. So, um, you know, number one, we have hourly team members who need and rely on this income to support their families. So we want to really try to step up and, and be able to go to bat for them with keeping our work rolling at the facility. Uh, but number two, I mean, you know, when we talk about our work that we do for our customers, when we talk about the value that we bring to the table, it's more valuable right now than ever before. Um, so I think we have a really good story and a really good um, justification for keeping our teams in these facilities to, to do work for these customers. So, you know, we have a few options here. We could talk to them about continuing the scope of work that we would normally do and, and nothing change, changes at all. We could, you know, just some other options might include uh, obviously detail cleaning this is a great opportunity especially if there's a shutdown and there are less people in our faci customer facilities it's a great opportunity for us to do detail cleaning uh, even disinfecting uh, throughout the building um, we could look at uh, performing additional services that can be done what a great time to do additional services while everybody's out of the building um, and I would go so far as to say you know, a lot of these things, as opposed to having our teams without work, um, I would go so far as to say, let's even do some of these additional services that we'd normally charge more money for. Let's do those. If it takes doing those for no more money to keep our teams in these places, let's do that. You know, think about the downside. Not only are our people going to be without a paycheck to support their families, but the reality is after a two, three week period, somebody 10, 11, $12 an hour, they're gonna go have, have to get a new job, a different job, most likely. So it also presents us with a, a future kind of potential staffing nightmare as we have to rehire uh, staff for a lot of these places. Um, so yeah, I guess a few different, few different options there. Yeah, no, that's good, that's good. And I, as I look at everything out there right now, to me, this is the biggest one that we want to navigate well. Yeah. So that because not only can we end up with a mass layoff, but then you could end up with a major hiring crisis when you need to ramp back up. Yeah. Um, and the last thing you need is to have to rehire a third of your staff yeah. Yeah. a month from now. It would, it would be a disaster. <laughs> yeah. And I would even even before you, you guys look at that option as far as, you know, laying people off or whatever. I mean, the reality is we all have some expense lines in our company, some some expenses that we could probably stand to redirect for a little while, a month or two months or three months um, to, to potentially help some of these people out and bridge the gap 
between the time that their you know their their uh, job site shuts down and the time they get back to work. So I think that needs to be a big focus before we just allow ourselves to lay people off. That's good. That's good. So so Brian, let's talk a, a little bit about and and I've gotten a ton of questions about um, about this and I think a lot of people are talking about this. What are some of the requests that maybe we've been getting during this time um, in terms of extra work? You know, what are some of those look like? And how do we think about pricing and staffing those? Um, yeah, good question. Um, so obviously you guys are seeing people are panicking out there. We have customers that are panicking. And in a lot of cases, we have customers coming to us and you guys do, do too, I'm sure, saying, I don't care what the rate is, get people in here. I want people walking around disinfecting nonstop. So we are seeing that. I mean, here's the, uh, I saw a stat uh, earlier today from ZipRecruiter saying that ads for cleaners um, are up 75% from normal in March, okay? So I would bet that a big part of that comes from people wanting additional services. So it's out there. Uh, we have a great opportunity here to do this. Um, so I think the thing that we're seeing more than any other is just people asking for additional bodies to help walk around and disinfect. Um, now here's, here, here are some things that I would suggest with that. So once again, that's good, kind of like we were talking about earlier, that's good old fashioned manual disinfection uh, being done in buildings. I would, um, if I were you guys, for any additional work situations, I would really uh, think long and hard about paying these people more money to do that. Uh, you know, while our customers and, and most employers out there, uh, everybody's running out of buildings with their hands up, working from home and closing down and everything else, here our teams are kind of going into the fire to do this stuff. So, <laughs> we're like the, yeah, we're like the, the, the first responders. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I would really think uh, uh, very seriously about paying our people better when it comes to these additional services to go in and disinfect. So now for, so in regard to just once again, good old manufacturing, uh, old kind of old fashioned disinfection, I would pay people a, a bare minimum of uh, an OT rate. So a time and a half rate to go in and do this work. So as you're thinking about pricing these things, really think about a much higher pay rate uh, to do them. So for, Standard disinfection, I would probably, the way we've approached it is most of the stuff we're doing on a T&M basis right now, as opposed to a fixed cost. In most cases, we're doing some fixed cost cases. But I would price this these things at a minimum, probably in the $40 an hour range to, to do this disinfection. And now that's going to vary a little bit as, you know, to where you're at in the country. A lot of people in the Northeast or way out West, you know, you have to pay higher rates than we do here in the Midwest. So, but I would really strongly encourage you guys to pay OT rates or time and a half to do manual disinfection at an additional service rate. Uh, I would also think about, uh, you know, other things to think about with that are just minimum charges. I would, I would really have some kind of minimum charge to go out and do this work. Also consider, all your PPE that you need, travel time, all that good stuff. Um, so in other, other additional work requests, uh, you guys are probably all either being asked for or offering right now, you know, fogging or electrostatic spraying, all that stuff. I would price all those things on a per square foot uh, basis, probably in the 12 cent at least uh, per square foot range or even more. Um, Here's the deal. We have a once again a very valuable service to people right now, and I would I, I would we don't want to be the people that go out there and price gouge and really just kill our customers here. This is an opportunity for us to step up and and once again be very credible and and really reinforce the value that we're bringing to the table. But the reality is we have uh, you know a, a supply or a product that's in very high demand right now. So I would really price this thing um, at a at a margin that may go a little bit above and beyond the normal waxing and the normal additional services that we would do in these buildings um, without price gouging, obviously. So 
Yeah, no, that's good. That's right. That's right. So it's I think it's appropriate and ethical to pay a premium but not gouge because yes. these, again we're mm -hmm. always in it for the long term relationship. So when it's all said and done, we want the customer to because this is going to settle down in six months from now. You want the customer to look at you and say, yeah. "You did a great job. You treated mm -hmm. me very fairly." Right. Um, but marking up four, five, six hundred percent would not <laughs> would yeah. not be the case. <clears throat> Um, you guys are seeing some price gouging going on right now with some of the items that we need to go in and perform this work with disinfectants, with uh, face masks, with goggles, with, uh, you know, different types of PPE. I've seen, you know, the N95 masks that we would need to go in and really kind of uh, respond to a reported uh, case of coronavirus. I've seen it marked up just outrageously. And I think I, I read an article the other day where Amazon's actually kind of... Uh, uh, disqualifying or disqualifying or kicking people off of Amazon for trying to price gouge on on some of these items. Hmm. Okay, so so Brian, next, and this this will kind of tie back into our first one about communicating with customers and also with our own in, internal staff. So, mm -hmm. and and this will also tie into our next one about limiting liability. So. <clears throat> How do we we navigate? Because this is going to happen to all of us yeah. <laughs> right here. That either a customer is going to say, "Hey, we have a confirmed case at our facility," um, or one of our employees is is going to have it. Yeah. Um, so we need to have something in place for for what that will look like, or um, when yes. it's out there, it's it's <laughs> it's kind of an unknown. So yeah, yeah, this, this is the top one, I guess. Um, and just to be clear, we're not yeah. attorneys and we're not advising yeah, no, you yeah. on, uh, but, but as we're thinking through this and we're trying to prepare this, I just want to give some thoughts on maybe how to think about this. So, yeah. Okay. So if we looked at, if we look at a confirmed report or case of coronavirus at one of our customer locations, the CD, and let me, let me direct everybody here also and, and reinforce this disclaimer that we're not pros or whatever, but, but check out the CDC website. It's a great resource. And it will tell you exactly how to approach these situations where there's a, a confirmed case. Now, there is a little bit of um, uh, kind of discrepancy between the CDC and OSHA with certain PPE that's needed after a confirmed case of coronavirus. So I would always just uh, resort to the uh, the most coverage in regard to PPE, which is uh, the OSHA uh, claim or the OSHA guideline. Um, but so if we have a confirmed case, this is you'll first refer back to your kind of leadership plan that you've got in place. I've talked to a number of contractors in our industry that have made the decision that if and when the, there is a confirmed case, they're out. They're not going to go in and perform the disinfection at that point. They're going to allow some other, maybe more qualified or more willing uh, company to come in and help their customers at that point, which is understandable. Um, I, I've talked to a number of people in that boat. We have, as a company, decided that if there is a confirmed case, we are going to trudge forward as long as everything, you know, we're going to handle these on a case by case basis but we are gonna move forward as long as everything kind of lines up with, with you know, uh, safety to our people. So the very first thing that the CDC recommends is that after the, the case is reported, that you wait up to 24 hours after that before your teams go in. And what that does is that allows those micro drops and all that other stuff to kind of settle and a, a lot, in a lot of cases even die. You know, this, this this virus survives for a few hours up to really a few days uh, per the CDC. But um, so step one, once again, wait 24 hours. They also say to open outside doors and windows to kind of increase air circulation to let some of that stuff blow and, and kind of, um, uh, I guess, get out of the building. Um, and then as we go in, we need to have the proper PPE. So at, once again, as we're talking about uh, after the reported case, we need to be suited up uh, per OSHA in goggles, in N95 um, respirator mask, in 
you know, really kind of a, a Tyvek uh, apron pantsuit or a full suit with a hood, uh, booties, and rubber gloves. So they're they're really sug not suggesting, but more requiring full PPE to go in after a report of coronavirus. So I would really refer you guys to the CDC website and then the OSHA portion uh, of the website to, to kind of just back that claim up. Um, so yeah, um, I think that's kind of where yeah, you're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's, let's move on to the liability because I think it's really ties into yeah. that. So as we think about um, protecting our people and protecting our customers mm -hmm. and, and limiting our liability, so, so one thing is that we would we would want to be careful about the people that we allow to do that sort of work. Yeah. So we we would never want to put somebody that was in a, a risk category, right? Um, in a disinfecting scenario, um, knowingly, um, yeah. to to protect those people. So again, we just would need to use wisdom and good judgment to try to yeah. figure that out. Um, and you know, because given the demographic of people, a lot of people need the money. And yeah. So we would want to encourage someone to make a bad decision because they were economically on hard times. That's a great thought. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about, you know, maybe the proper PPE that someone would need and maybe information that we should give them before yeah. we, we send them out to do some of this work, this yeah. first response type work. No, I think you make a great point. You know, if you guys think about the ideal employee in our industry, it's typically one that's a little bit older. Uh, where the work ethic is more often than not a little bit better than maybe a younger person. Um, so that's a great thought. You know, obviously we don't want our, our most high risk people for this virus to go in and actually uh, clean it up. Um, you know, we should we definitely choose people who are less susceptible to that. I would also, and back to the pay thing here real quick, if we're looking at a crew going in to do this, you know, like you guys, we have a number of team members that are willing to run through a wall for us and our service and our company. Um, but I'm telling you, the ball game changes when somebody's strapping on all of this PPE and Tyvek and goggles and respirators and rubber gloves and, and all that stuff. The mindset, uh, I would imagine, changes very quickly. So as we're talking about after a reported case of coronavirus, I would I would strongly encourage you guys with your pricing to price price in paying double time for this scenario. I mentioned time and a half earlier. I would try to resort to double time for this uh, for the pay for these people that are willing to go in and do this. Um, but back to the PPE once again, OSHA there is a slight discrepancy between what the CDC requires and what or, or suggests and what OSHA requests. So reference both of these things and, and you know, kind of decide for yourselves how you want to do this. I would lean toward the more strict rule that OSHA has a, and a, about, and that is basically coverage from head to toe after a, after a reported case. So that would be goggles, N95, respirator mask, uh, full suit, Tyvek type suit, uh, rubber medical grade gloves um, and booties. Uh, so covered basically head to toe. And then what about with um, with customers? Do you think there's that, you know, if one of our employees with a confirmed case or, yeah. um, or also uh, just think about liability with customers, you know, maybe even defining what we're going to do and the things that we can do and can't promise will be done. I mean, I, I, don't, I think we'd want to be careful to not give the customer the impression that we're we're going yeah. to prevent this for them or yeah. that we're going to, um, you know, I would assume it's probably not safe to offer guarantees of any sort in this yeah, sort of situation. Bet. Probably a great opportunity. You, you know, you mentioned a good point here. Probably a great opportunity for us to offer a, you know, some kind of disclaimer or something to our customers to guarantee that we're not um, going to be held liable for the results of what we're doing is we're in there disinfecting. Um, we definitely don't want, uh, definitely don't want to do that. So I think it is important to outline to these customers though, you know, as I think about uh, the number of times and the ways that we've been approached from customers in this, um, you know, they're, they're looking to us to be the professionals and to really fix everything with this. Um, 
I think it's important to mention that we can come in and, and disinfect and we can come in and do what we're pros at doing. But the moment somebody comes back into that building and touches a doorknob or touches a front door or touches a desk or whatever, the moment that that happens, infecting begins again, right? So, you know, as we come in and perform a $2,000 job or a $5,000 job or whatever of disinfection, it's only good until people start populating the building again. So I think it's important that customers know that and don't think that when we come in to do this, it's a fix all because it's not a fix all. It definitely helps and it's disinfecting while we're there and shortly thereafter until their people get back in the building and start sneezing all over the place. Yeah, this would be a good time for us if, if we're concerned just to tighten up our contracts. Um, you know, sometimes crises help us think about Okay, what do we do in the event of X, Y, or Z happening? Yeah. Um, so it's something for us to think about. So I would encourage all of you all, if you have questions or are worried about liability in any of these areas, to talk with your attorney and to see if there's any language you need to include or in your work orders or in your contracts or anything to, to make sure that you're not putting yourself out there. So listen, I know that we were planning to do a live Q&A here and that wasn't possible because of the technical difficulties. Um, for everybody that's part of the mastermind group, we're gonna have a lot of follow-up on this. We're gonna have a lot of this information uh, post it on there in a in a separate section for this. Uh, but if anyone has any questions, they can reach out to me. Uh, if you go to EliteBusinessCoaching.net, you can find my contact information there, and I'm happy to answer any questions or send any follow-up information. Um, if you'd like to be a part of our mastermind group, you can click on the mastermind groups link on the website, and you'll have access to to this webinar and a bunch of other webinars. Um, but probably most importantly, you have access to a lot of other colleagues and peers in the industry that can really walk with you through this um, so we can come out on the other side hopefully better and stronger companies hope you all have a great rest of the week and you stay healthy and um, and we will talk to you soon